with you today. Thank you for joining us, whether you're in the room or outside on the patio or joining us at home. Uh, I want to welcome you. Uh, I'm so glad to get to be here. It's a privilege to get to, to share God's word and dive in together this Father's Day weekend. Uh, in fact, actually, Dre dropped one of my children. Uh, he forgot also we have Joey, but it's okay. <laughs> he surprised us too, so it's fine. Um, <laughs> Uh, we're so glad you're here. If you're, uh, if you're here in your program, there's a green and white message note sheet. If you're uh, joining us online, uh, on whatever platform that is, there's a link close at hand uh, to get you a note sheet as well. Uh, that's just a tool for you to kind of follow along as we dig into God's word together. But I'm going to open us with a word of prayer and we're going to jump in. Father, today, God, as, as we come before you, we ask that you, as our heavenly father, that you would meet us in this time that you would open up your word, that you would pull out any distractions that are in the way, God, that you would remove the distraction of my words, that you would remove the distraction of the chaos around us that might be distracting us. Would you remove the distraction of the chaos within us in our own heart? Would you help us to focus in on your words? Would you, through your Holy Spirit, shine light into our lives, reveal your son to us? Would you teach us, Lord, what it is to be your people and to live the lives that you are calling us to live. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. On the front of your note sheet, the very first section there says the aftermath. And that's because as we jump back into the life of Jesus this weekend, we are coming in to the aftermath of a couple of decisions that Jesus has made uh, that to the people around him uh, don't seem like they're going very well. Uh, in John chapter 5, Jesus very intentionally moves towards a lame man and heals him. But this, the religious leaders are not that thrilled with. They, instead of being excited that God is doing something new, instead of being excited for this man that he's been healed, instead they're upset that Jesus has done this on the Sabbath. See, the religious leaders had built up some rules around how to keep God's day of rest uh, and they had decided that, that this was not something that you should do. And in addition to that, in addition to finally kind of pushing the religious leaders over the edge, and we'll see today that this was the, the catalyst to start them plotting to take Jesus' life. In addition to that, this last week we saw at the end of chapter 6, Jesus teaches a message that Michael called a, a thinning the herd message that for the crowd who had kind of gathered around Jesus, who were interested in this new teacher, this new leader, this new rabbi who was healing people and driving out demons and, and making these miraculous meals out of tiny lunches, that this message was, was too difficult to follow. It was too strange. It was way beyond what they were ready for. And we saw last week that many of them began abandoning him, that even for Jesus' closest disciples, it brought them to this critical crossroads of, are we gonna follow Jesus even when it doesn't make sense to us? And we're gonna see today that as we go in, even some of the people who have known Jesus the longest are gonna be second guessing what it is that he's doing. I don't know if you've ever been a fan of a, a celebrity, an actor, uh, a, a musician who hits it big one moment and then you just, you turn around and it's almost like they've absolutely disappeared. They've gone from being uh, at the height of their career to almost uh, obscurity, right? And we see that sometimes in our culture, how people can be the center of attention and all of a sudden they do one thing or someone finds something they said years ago and all of a sudden they're down at the bottom of the heap. And we'll see that that's the concern that people have for Jesus at this point. Their concern is that he's been this, this big leader that people are gathering around and yet now he's made some decisions that are bringing him to the bottom of the totem pole. And so we're gonna jump into God's word in just a moment. But before we do, if you're brand new, I wanna welcome you and talk a little bit about this series that we're in. We're in a series uh, right now called Signs, The Path to Life. And so in this series, we're... We're uh, jumping into the Gospel of John, which was written by a close friend and follower of Jesus, the Apostle John, someone who traveled with him during his three years of ministry, who got to see what Jesus was up to uh, up close and personal. And John is writing at the end of his life. And at the end of his life, John is writing, uh, at this point, Matthew, Mark, and Luke have already been written. And so now John is kind of writing from his perspective some important things that he thinks will help supplement those accounts of Jesus' life. 
And he's highlighting especially one thing that we've been looking at in this series is seven signs that John lays out that he thinks uh, give us more insight into who Jesus is, what it is he came to do, and what it means to live, to follow this path to life that Jesus lays out. And so that's what this series has been all about. What we'll see today is that there are three groups of people in Jesus' life who, when it comes to Jesus' mission, when it comes to what Jesus is all about, that they are missing it. That there are people who think that Jesus has come uh, to just gain the popularity and attention of the people around him, when what he's truly come to do is serve by his sacrifice. And so today we're gonna see three groups of people who are missing what it is Jesus is all about. And in that, we're gonna see three ways that we too sometimes are in danger of missing what it is that Jesus wants to do in our lives. And so we're gonna jump in to John chapter seven in verse one. And so if you have your Bibles, now is the time to open them. If you have your app, now is the time to open that. And we're gonna be jumping in uh, to chapter seven going through these kind of accounts as Jesus is coming off the aftermath of these decisions that he's made. So after this, and so that's right after, this is after this teaching, after the crowd and the disciples, many of them have kind of walked away and he's still got his core followers, but his his poll numbers have plummeted. After this, Jesus went around in Galilee. So that's in the north of the nation of Israel. It's kind of Jesus' home area. A lot of his disciples are described as Galileans because they have a specific accent from that area. And so he's hanging out in this northern region in Galilee. He did not want to go about in Judea. So that's in the south. That's the area where Jerusalem is. That's where the temple is. That's the center of both political and religious power in the nation. He didn't want to go to Judea because the Jewish leaders there were looking for a way to kill him. But... When the festival of tabernacles was near, and so this is where we need a slight detour to talk about this festival of tabernacles. Uh, Tabernacles was a, a festival commemorating what Jesus did for his people in the wilderness thousands of years before. That after, uh, after God freed the people of Israel uh, through the Exodus, he met with them in the wilderness, and he chose to have them build for him a tent structure like kind of a portable temple so that his presence would be in the middle of his people. And so all, every year, the nation of Israel would celebrate this festival uh, around harvest time for seven days, culminating in this eighth day of, of a grand feast together where they would remember and commemorate that God lived among them, that God actually came to live with them in their circumstance when they were nomads walking through the desert, he was willing to be nomadic and live in a tent with them as well. And so this festival was set to commemorate it. In fact, the, uh, the Jewish historian Josephus says that this was the, the biggest of the three major festivals, the most popular of the three, uh, which to, uh, to Michael and I this last week as we were kind of discussing this was kind of surprising because we would have thought something like Passover would have been a bigger deal. Uh, Uh, But Josephus, he at least highlights that Tabernacles was the one that the people were all about. And it might just have been because it was kind of fun. Uh, they would, for a week, they would build these structures either outside, if they, if they lived in the rural areas, outside kind of in their fields, or if they lived in the cities up on top of their roofs, they would build these little tent structures, and for a week, they would live in these tents. And they would celebrate that God was once present with them as like as they were his people when they were in the wilderness. And so kind of as the backdrop to this, we see uh, Jesus coming to be present with his people in the middle of their celebration of what God has done in the past. And so this is the festival that's kind of the backdrop for this whole conversation. It's a big deal. It's something where a ton of people are traveling to Jerusalem and we're gonna see Jesus' brothers kind of key into that in a moment. Verse three, it says this, Jesus' brothers said to him, Leave Galilee and go to Judea so that your disciples there can see the works that you're doing. They're like, hey, everyone's, they're not following you anymore. They're not listening to you. You're losing popularity. If you want to be a big deal, in fact, they say to them, no one who wants to become a public figure, no one who wants to be a celebrity, no one who wants political power, no one who wants people to follow them acts in secret. Since you're doing these things, show yourself to the world. For even his own brothers 
John's going to key in here. Even his own brothers didn't believe him. And so when I first read this, I was thinking back to my relationship with my brother. I'm like, wow, it's, it's hard. It kind of seems like they're sort of ripping him a little bit, right? Like as, as good brothers would do. Uh, that they're just kind of like giving him a hard time, right? Which is sort of how, you know, I tend to treat my brother. But that's, you know, that's fine. Uh, and so that's kind of the first way I read it. But then there might even be some good intentions here, right? They might see their brother who's done these miracles and has had this, this kind of teaching ministry. And they're just like, hey, hey, go, go do, like, go where the people are. Get some attention. Everyone else is traveling to Jerusalem. You should go there too. And so they think that they have a better idea of what Jesus should do than Jesus does. Verse six, therefore, Jesus told them, my time is not yet here. For you, any time will do. Right? And so they're telling him, hey, go make a grand entrance into Jerusalem. And Jesus is saying, it's not time for my grand entrance yet. He says, the world can't hate you, but it hates me because I testify that its works are evil. And so he's going to key out, hey, brothers, you guys, are, you guys are just a part of the world. You just see things the way the world sees it. You're living the way the world lives. And so you can go to this festival or not go to the festival. The world's not going to care. But, but me, I'm highlighting the evil that's out there. And if I go, they're going to hate me for that. And what's fascinating, and we'll see in this a little bit, like what Jesus is talking about is not even the evil in the world that his, uh, his neighbors or his brothers might have even thought would have been highlighted. They would have thought the evil in the world would be the, the wicked, pagan Roman Empire. But we'll see that what Jesus is going to key, key in on is the, the hearts of the religious, le religious leaders who, even though they're outside, seems to be living up to this important self-righteous code. And on the inside, they've absolutely rejected what God is about. He says, you go to the festival. I'm not going up to this festival because my time hasn't yet fully come. And so we'll see that even though Jesus says that he's not going up to the festival, that it's not a, a definitive statement. He's not saying like, I'm never going to go. He's just saying, you guys, you guys go without me. I'm not going to go up today. After this, or after he said this, he stayed in Galilee. Then in verse 10, however, after his brothers had left for the festival, he went also, not publicly, but in secret. And so this isn't Jesus going back on his words of what he said to his brothers, but this is him being an example of listening and following. That he knew that even though the worldly wisdom at the time would be, hey, everyone's gathered at this festival, go make some noise. Go show yourself off. Show people what you can do. That he's willing to listen to the Father as to what his, the timing should be for his ministry and how it is that he should carry about uh, what, this task that he's been given. And so instead of going and making a big scene, he goes up secretly and quietly. Verse 11, now at the festival, the Jewish leaders were watching for Jesus and asking, where is he? And so the leaders, they're, they're on lookout. They're expecting him to be at this festival. And they're, they're curious, why is this new hotshot teacher who's gaining all this popularity, why is he not here for this popular festival? Among the crowds, there was widespread whispering about him. Some said, he's a good man. Others replied, no, he deceives the people. And so we see here public opinion is torn on Jesus. People don't know what to think about him. But no one would say anything publicly about him for fear of the leaders. And so the crowd can tell, the people can tell that the religious leaders are not pleased with Jesus and the attention that he's pulling away from them. Verse 14, not until halfway through the festival did Jesus go up to the temple courts and begin to teach. The Jews were amazed and asked, how did this man get such learning without having been taught? Now, at first, this question almost sounds, it sounds kind of like a neutral question or it could even sound like a positive question. Like they're like, oh, how, how is Jesus so smart without getting any teaching? But what this is, is this question is questioning Jesus' authority. Because rabbis at this time, uh, they would always have been taught under another rabbi. And if they were to come teach the people, they would teach while 
leaning on the authority of people who have come before them. They would say, hey, this rabbi said this, and this uh, elder has said this, and now I offer this piece of wisdom. That's like maybe a slight spin on it or an addition or just reiterating what had already been taught. That it was really common for rabbis to stand on the shoulders of the people who had come before. But what we know from other places in the Gospels is that when Jesus would teach, he would teach very differently. He would teach with his own authority. He would just tell it how it is. And the people are keying in on this, but they're kind of questioning at this point, because of all the turmoil and all the questions about who Jesus is and what it is that he's up to, they're kind of questioning, well, who is Jesus to say these things? Who, is, who, does, who does he get his authority from? How does he get these words? How does he know that this is what life should be like? How does, how does he teach like this if he never spent time learning under one of the elders in the past? And so Jesus answers them, my teaching is not my own. It comes from the one who sent me. Anyone who chooses to do the will of God will find out whether my teaching comes from God or whether I speak on my own. Whoever speaks on their own does so to gain personal glory, but he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is a man of truth. There's nothing false about him. Has not Moses given you the law, yet not one of you keeps the law? Why are you trying to kill me? And so Jesus keys in on this thing that we're going to touch on a little bit later of, hey, if you really wanted to follow what God had said, you would recognize where my words are coming from. You would see where these words and this authority comes from if your desire was to do what God wanted. But now he's going to shift from talking to the crowd to kind of highlighting the religious leaders specifically. And he's going to say to them, hey, if you value the law, God's law, if you value what Moses has given you so highly, why are you willing to break one of the Ten Commandments and murder me? If you're going to live as if you're, you're completely righteous and following everything God has said, why in your heart do you want me dead? And we're going to see that this is one of those moments where Jesus uh, is doing that thing he does where he can tell what someone's internal motivations and what's going on inside their heart. Uh, He can tell what's going on there better than kind of the people around. And we'll see that the crowd's going to be sort of surprised that he's calling out the religious leaders uh, so harshly. Uh, When we jump to verse 20, in verse 20, uh, the crowd says, you're demon possessed. The crowd answered, who's trying to kill you? They're like, this just, just, you know, first century Jew for like, you're crazy, man. Like, what are you talking about? No one, like, they don't like you, but what is this whole, like, them trying to kill you business? What are you talking about? And Jesus said to them, and so now he's shifting his attention from the crowd at large to these religious leaders. And Jesus said to them, I, I did one miracle, and you're all amazed. Now, at this point, through John, we've seen Jesus do multiple miracles. Right? But we're going to see he's referring to one specific miracle that was the tipping point for them. Is yet, yet because Moses gave you circumcision, and then John's going to kind of insert here, though actually it didn't come from Moses, but from the patriarchs, meaning that Moses in the law says, on the eighth day, boys who are born into the nation of Israel should be circumcised. Uh, But the practice of circumcision was given all the way before Moses to Abraham as a, a picture of God being with Abraham and his family. And then through Moses, it becomes a part of the law for all of Israel so that they would be under uh, the, the covenant, the promise that God has made with them. And it was a sign of taking this young child and bringing him into the community. It was considered a blessing given to this child that now through this physical sign, he would be marked as belonging to Yahweh. And so the religious leaders, Jesus is going to key in on here, like, hey, Moses gave you this sign of circumcision in the law, and you circumcise a boy on the Sabbath. You give this blessing to this boy, any of these boys. If the eighth day falls on the Sabbath, you don't wait till the ninth day. Now, if a boy can be circumcised on the Sabbath, so the law of Moses cannot be broken, why are you angry with me for healing a whole man's body on the Sabbath? Stop judging by mere appearances, but instead judge correctly. Jesus lays out this argument for them that for many of us, if we're just kind of jumping into this in our own one-on-one time, it's so kind of just crowded in first century Jewish culture that we would miss a lot of what's going on. But he's saying, hey, there's this 
thing that God has commanded that you're willing to do. You're willing to, to circumcise someone because that, that's seen as a blessing. And yet when I come and I bless someone by healing them on the Sabbath, you're upset that I've broken your man-made rules that you've added on to what it means for the Sabbath to be a day of rest. He critiques them not for doing the circumcisions, but for not caring enough to do more, for not applying the same principles to his act of healing. And we'll see later that they're missing something really important in this piece. And so that's our passage. There it is, John 7, verses 1 through 24. And so in the aftermath of Jesus' ministry and teaching, People's opinions are kind of thrown into chaos. The brothers are thinking Jesus should do one thing. The crowd is torn on where he gets his authority. And the religious leaders are looking for an opportunity, any excuse to kill him. And in fact, six months from now, they'll have their way. And so what I want to do with our time remaining is, is highlight these three things that these groups of people miss in this narrative and talk about how we are also in danger of missing those same things. And so on the inside of your note sheet, there's a section that says three things that were missed. And the, the first fill in there is the signs. The signs. The first thing that was missed is the signs. Think about Jesus' brothers, right? Jesus has been doing his ministry for about two and a half years at this point. Uh, this, what's happening in chapter seven, is taking place about six months after the feeding of the 5,000. Jesus' brothers, for sure, even if in the beginning of his ministry, it was just like, oh, that's that crazy thing that our brother's doing, like whatever. At some point, they would have come to check out what he was all about. They would have had all the opportunity to see the things that Jesus was doing, the way that he was healing people or, or taking authority over, uh, over demons and drawing them, drawing them out of the oppressed or, or providing these miraculous meals, right? Like there, there's a chance that at least one of them could have been at the feeding of the 5,000 and gone and shared with the rest, or at least they've heard the stories of the things that their brother has been up to, right? They're not oblivious to who he is and what it is that he can do and how he teaches. But they don't believe. We've got it there in your note sheet. We've got it on the screen. John is super clear with us in verse five that for not even, or for even his own brothers did not believe in him. And I think one thing that's fascinating is that even though Jesus' brothers, they, they don't believe at this point, we know that this isn't the end of their story. We know that at least two of them later in their life will come to faith in Jesus. And we know that because two of his brothers uh, are authors of books in the New Testament. The books of both James and Jude are written by sons of Mary and Joseph, so half-brothers of Jesus. Uh, and so something happened in their life that changed their opinion. Something happened that went from them thinking their, their brother is just this teacher who's looking for people's public opinion, or another, there's another story where his family comes and tries to like pull him away, and they're like, ooh, Jesus has kind of like lost it a little bit. Uh, something changed their mind. And I'm willing to bet it's the same thing that would have changed my mind if, if my brother was going around talking about how he was God's promised king coming as the, the savior and then made all the religious leaders upset and was put to death and then came back to life. Probably changed my opinion. Um, and so we think, especially because six months out from that event, they still clearly don't believe it's very likely that that's exactly what happened. Just like for any of us, if our crazy family member died and then came back to life, we'd be like, maybe they're not so crazy. Maybe I should find out what it is they've been talking about. And what's really fascinating for me is the way that both brothers open up their letters. So they're writing to the early church. They're encouraging the church and how they should live and how they should live their lives. Uh, but both James and Jude don't even come close to touching on who their brother is. James writes, James, a servant of God, and the Lord Jesus Christ. And the word servant in NIV is maybe even stronger than that. It's probably closer to slave, right? And so how many of your younger brothers would be willing to be your slave? Um, not mine. Uh, <laughs> although growing up, well, anyway. Um, and then Jude, similarly, Jude says, Jude, a slave of Jesus Christ and the brother of James. 
And so something radically has changed for these men. But at this point in their life, they're not seeing what Jesus is up to. Jesus' close followers, his disciples, they're seeing it. We saw that last week, that when everyone else is leaving, Peter's like, man, where else should we go? You alone have what we need. But the brothers, the brothers aren't getting it yet. And in the same way that the brothers have missed what's going on, we too are fully capable of missing the signs that God has put in our life to remind us of who he is and what it is that he's about. And what I love about the story of James and Jude is that it highlights that faith is a journey. That faith is not just something that's that's static. It's not just a switch that's flipped from off to on at some point and then stays on. That it's something that we progress in, something that, that we grow in. All throughout the Gospels, you see people who are presented with clear evidence of who Jesus is who just don't get it, just like his brothers in this passage. And maybe, maybe that's even you right now. Maybe God has been trying to get your attention. Maybe there have been signs that he's been putting in your way that you've been missing. In Romans 1, it talks about how all of creation is a sign to us that, that there is a God who is active in this world, who is drawing us to him. Romans 2 talks about how uh, it, even in our hearts, in our conscience, there's something there that resonates with the truth of God's word, that he's put something inside of each and every one of us to help us see that his truth is real. Maybe it's in the person of Jesus. You're starting to see that, yes, he's wise, but he's more than wise. And yes, he's kind, but he's more than kind. That maybe he's someone worth giving your loyalty to. Maybe you've seen the difference that he's made in the life of a friend or a spouse or a family member. How their life has been radically transformed. And there's nothing else that you have to explain it other than the work of Jesus in their life. Maybe you're starting to see scripture make sense for the first time ever. And the signs are starting to add up. But maybe just like Jesus' brothers, when it comes to those signs, there's something in you that just kind of wants to ignore them. There's something about who Jesus is. Imagine being his brother and growing up with him. No one thinks their sibling is God, right? If there's anyone that's gonna, like, (laughs) there's no way. And so there's something in them that just doesn't want to believe, that doesn't want to pay attention. And sometimes there's something in us that doesn't want to look at and add up what the signs are pointing us to. And so if that's you, if a little bit of that story reminds you of your own personal life right now, I wanna encourage you just to do something really simple this evening. Whether it's during our our time of reflection at the end of this service, or whether it's when you're alone in your room later tonight, just ask, Jesus, one simple thing. Jesus, if you're real, and if you're who you say you are, would you open my eyes to what you're trying to show me? And just let him take it from there. If he's not real, literally no harm done, right? But if he is, and you don't, you might seriously be missing out. But for those of us here who have already given our life to Jesus, faith is still a journey for us too. That's just because we've given Jesus our loyalty and given him our lives at some point in our life and received his forgiveness, that doesn't mean that we're, our faith is never gonna be challenged in our life, that we're never gonna be challenged with something that causes us to wonder if we should trust him or not. And so it could be uh, an act of obedience that he's calling us to, uh, an area of rebellion in our life that we've guarded for a long time that he's, he's encouraging us to let go of, a place that we feel like we have received life from before and he's trying to show us, no, real life is in giving that up to me. Maybe it's a, a step of faith that he's calling you to, uh, a new ministry to join, uh, something to start up, uh, a conversation to pick up with a, a coworker that scares you out of your mind because you don't know if you're gonna have the information that they're gonna ask for. And you're not sure if that's what you should do. Maybe it's a, a job that he's calling you to leave, a job that he's calling you to pursue. Maybe there's a relationship in your life that he's calling you to to be done with, someone who's pulling you away from him instead of 
helping you gain momentum in your walk. And a lot of those times, I know for me, when he challenged me, challenges me on something like that that's scary, a lot of times what I want to do is ask him to give me uh, some sort of sign, something new to show me that this really is from him. And discernment is really important. Making sure that we know what God is calling us to is important, but there are times when we know what he's calling us to. And we just keep asking for more and more. There are times when our, our faith begins to wane and the question we start asking is, God, would you show me a new sign to give me new faith? And I think sometimes he's gracious to us and he gives us that. But other times what he wants is not to show us something new, but to remind us of what he's already shown us to draw our attention back to the signs that already exist in our life, whether it's the times he's shown up for us in adversity in the past, whether it's to remind us of the growth that we've experienced in our relationship with him the last time that we took a step of obedience and the life that that brought us. There are so many different ways that he might draw us back to individual signs, but many times I think the thing that he wants to remind us of is the same sign that changed the mind of his brothers. So he was willing to go so far as to die on our behalf. And then we wanna ask him, we wanna ask Jesus, do you really love me enough? Is your power enough to draw me into this new thing? Are you gonna really be with me? Have you forgotten me, Jesus? Am I sitting here without, with these unanswered prayers because you're ignoring me? When we reach those low points, I think many times he just wants to gently and kindly remind us of the sign of his love for us, his willingness to go to the cross and die on our behalf. The same thing that had the power to change the hearts and minds of his brothers can change the hearts and minds of us when we're at those low points in our journey of faith. The second thing that's missed, so that's the first thing, is that sometimes we miss the signs of what Jesus is doing or has already done around us. The second thing is the desire to follow, the desire to follow. When Jesus is talking to the crowd and they're asking him, hey, where do you get this authority? You didn't receive any teaching. Where does this really come from? And his answer to them is, hey, if you really wanted to follow God, you would be able to recognize where my teaching comes from. That same principle is alive and active today in our lives as well. Imagine for a moment that maybe this last year with everything going on with all the the COVID pandemic, maybe... That's the year that you came to faith. And now for the first time ever, you're growing in this new relationship with Jesus. And at the same time, you know, maybe like a month ago, you're doing the online dating thing. You found someone on Bumble. You did a couple of dating, uh, a couple of dates at like a coffee shop. And now it's starting to become serious. And you're like, you know what? I, this is my first dating relationship. As a follower of Jesus, I want to figure out how to do this right. And so now all of a sudden you're looking for ways to do that. Uh, and you kind of bump into the New Testament's clear teaching uh, that as followers of Jesus, there's not supposed to be even a hint of sexual immorality in our life, right? And so you're in this new dating relationship, maybe even bring it up in your life group. And so you're, you're talking about it together. And you're like, you know, I, I'm pretty sure this is saying like, like, no funny business while, like, in my relationship, right? Like, I'm, you're, you're, to you, you're like, I feel like this is kind of clear. And let's say, like, someone in your life group, maybe also a new believer, maybe someone who's been at Rocky Peak for a long time, I don't know, they're like, you know what, I've always understood the New Testament talking about that to just kind of be referring to people who are already married. Because, you know, you stood up there and you made a commitment, and so, like, that whole thing, that's just, like, for marriage. And then the rest of, you know, until you're married, you can just kind of do whatever you want. And if you're in a great life group, right, the life group leader kind of steps in and maybe offers some clarity, (laughs) gently. Um, Or maybe that's a side conversation that happens, right, outside of life group, and you're just kind of talking about that. Where your heart is, what you've already decided about your relationship with Jesus, and I don't mean just sexually, but in the big picture. If you've decided, you know what, Jesus is my all in all. He is my Lord and Savior. He's my king. I do what he wants, even when it doesn't make sense. Then in that issue, clarity might come pretty quickly. Because the New Testament doesn't really mince words on that. 
it's pretty clear what it's talking about in those passages. And it's very clear that sex is designed for marriage and only in marriage. But if your heart is conflicted, if, if Jesus is just another input into your life, just another voice, but the authority in your life is your own desires, your own passions, then now it's going to be real hard not just to make the decision. It's going to be real hard to know what the Bible is saying. Because now you have another opinion that is real tempting to want to listen to that will make it real easy to simply step away from that one area of your life. And I use the, the example of sexual immorality because I think most of us in this room understand what the Bible's teaching on that is. But it could be something really different. It could have to do with the, the security that you want in your life for your future. Right? It, it could have to do with this... Uh, and we live, we live in a culture and a world that lifts up the American dream and a house and three and a half kids and a picket fence and a dog and, and retiring by like your mid-60s that lifts that up as like, well, that's the expectation. And you won't really find that in the pages of scripture. But if that's what your heart is set on, nothing in the Bible is going to convict you to move away from that, to even consider that that might not be God's plan for your life. But if you're committed to following Jesus, no matter which way that he pulls you, no matter what it is that his plan is for your life, then now you're open to him leading you on a path that might be much greater than simply the American dream, into a path that has security found in him, not in a bank account, that has importance directed by him and the lives that he wants you to touch. By us deciding ahead of time that he's worth following. All of a sudden, it opens up these new possibilities for us to see his word clearly. And so we need to decide who's gonna rule our life. And we need to take a hard look and ask, do I have the will to follow Jesus today if tomorrow what he asks for is something I really don't want? if it's gonna require the loss of a relationship, if it's gonna require the changing of a dream, if it's gonna require living in a way that's uncomfortable, surrounded by a world that lifts comfortability and happiness above all else. Am I willing to follow his way or am I still committed to hearing what he has to say and then kind of weighing out where that authority comes from? Because the danger is that we would give up God's will for our life for simply ours. And when we do that, it never turns out as well as we think it would. The last thing that's missed has to do with Jesus' interaction with the religious leaders towards the end of the passage. And that last thing is the big picture. The big picture. Right? Jesus is talking to them about their attitude towards circumcision. He's like, hey, you're willing to circumcise a boy on the Sabbath and yet you're having trouble with this whole healing thing. Like, obviously, you guys are you're not making correct judgments, right? That's the last thing he says to us in the passage that we read. He says, hey, stop judging by the outside and make better judgments. The religious leaders were so committed to their understanding of God's law that they were missing the big picture of what God is all about in Scripture, of what it is that God is doing. They're so committed to the laws that they've put on top of Leviticus and Deuteronomy, right? All of their human-made interpretations, right? We talked about a few weeks ago, uh, Michael talked about how they were so committed to not doing work that tailors weren't allowed to walk around on the Sabbath with just a, a needle in their collar, that that was considered working, right? That's not found in the Bible. That's just them trying to find ways to define what work is, that they're so committed to their man-made rules that they miss all the way back in Genesis, that God created people not simply to follow external rules, but to be his representatives, to be his image bearers, to show this world what he is like by how we live. That we're all called to represent him on a heart level at our character. Yes, with a commitment to his righteousness. 
but not only in our actions, in our hearts. Jesus elaborates on this uh, more in your note sheet and up on the screen in Matthew 23. And so here, the religious leaders that he's going to identify in this passage are the teachers of the law and the Pharisees. He says, woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices, your mint and dill and cumin, but you've neglected the more important matters of the law. Or other translations will say the weightier matters of the law. Justice, mercy, and faithfulness. He's like, hey, you're, you're literally giving a tenth of your like herb garden, but you've missed out on the bigger things of what God is doing in the law. And then he lists three things, justice, mercy, and faithfulness that are not just actions that people are supposed to take, they are character qualities of who God is at his core that are reflected all through both the Old and New Testament. And he says, you're absolutely missing it. He says, you should have practiced the later without neglecting the former. You blind guides. You strain out a gnat, but swallow a camel. I love some of the imagery that Jesus comes up with. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they're full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and dish, and then the outside will also be clean. Man, we're often so ready to settle for a life with God that looks only at our external actions, that looks only at the things that we do, and we miss the much more important aspect of life transformation that Jesus wants to impact on our hearts. That Jesus doesn't want to just have us clean up the outside of our lives where we're full of selfishness and greed and lust and pride. What good is it to not use foul language and harbor bitterness in our hearts? We are called as his people to not only care about doing what's good, but to be people who are good, made after the heart of our God, to love what he loves and how he loves. Not simply follow a list of rules. Christ's vision is that through the work of the Holy Spirit that you would be transformed to be more and more like him at the level of your desires, not simply your interactions with people. Man, this has been a big challenge to me uh, this last year um, or since this year has started. In January... Um, I was kind of praying, like, God, it's a new, it seems like a good time to pray at the new year. Um, God, it's, it's a new year. What do, you, what do you have for me? What do you want me to do? What do you want me to focus on? Uh, what's, the, what's the next thing that you want me uh, to, to do? And in my, you know, in my heart, as I'm asking these questions, I'm like absolutely thinking like, okay, God, what ministry thing or what person do you want me to talk with and work on a relationship with? Or how do you want me to change? What do you want, what do you want me to do? was kind of what was going around in my head or especially like God can you show me show me my future how many of us would love just, <laughs> just like a 10 second glimpse um, and his answer that came back pretty quickly and was confirmed through multiple I wish I had time to get into the whole like story of it um, his answer very quickly was I, I want to show you more of who I am I want you to know my character I was like, well, I mean, it doesn't sound bad. I'm like, no, okay. It's not, you know, my future, but fine. Um, and God, through a number of people, um, ended up drawing me to this passage uh, in Exodus that I was very unfamiliar with um, that actually turns out is the part of the Bible, the Bible quotes of itself the most often. Um, it's the first time in the Bible that God ever says what, who he is and what he cares about where God actually describes his own desires and his character. Uh, if you're interested, uh, it's Exodus, 30, 30, ooh, Exodus 34, 6 and 7. Um, we don't have time to dig into it today. It's not what the message is about. But uh, for me, it's all of a sudden, it, it kind of spilled into this deep dive into God's character and, uh, and what it is that he loves and what it is that he cares about. 
Um, and if you knew me at all during this time, you could not bump into me and ask me how I'm doing without hearing Exodus 34, 6, and 7. Um, I was memorizing it. I was reading about it. I was listening to podcasts about it. Uh, and God was just kind of unpacking his, his character in this passage. Um, but what's been interesting is, is recently I've been sort of feeling a, like noticing a shift in kind of how he wants to apply this. At first it was just like, hey, this is who I am. I'm compassionate and gracious and slow to anger and abounding in love and faithfulness and, uh, and forgiving and willing to forgive wickedness, rebellion, and sin. And yet I, I'm just and I hold everyone to the same standards. My standards don't change. And, uh, and yet it started, he started shifting that and shifting the focus and kind of asking, all right, Tim, this is who I am. Is that who you are? Ooh, that's not fun. Um, it's one thing to have God unpack who he is. It's another to have him ask, do you match up? But I think for all of us, right, that's the journey that we need to be on. Not asking, okay, God, do I match up to a list of expectations that I've kind of grown up over time thinking like these are the 12 things I need to do in my week in order to be a good Christian. Instead is to ask that question, okay, in my heart, do I reflect what God cares about? And do I live life the way that he would be calling me to live? Because if not, then just as the Pharisees, we're missing the big picture, that Jesus didn't come to gather up a group of people to have high expectations on the what they do who neglect their heart. He came to provide us freedom from sin so that our hearts could change, so that we could desire what it is that we were supposed to desire in the first place. The world doesn't need a bunch more self-righteous people who think they have it all figured out, who hold others to high expectations that they don't match up to themselves. Right? We see that all around us of every stripe. Right? People who think they have it all together and everyone else has missed it. The world needs people whose hearts are for Jesus, who are living for him, who care about him, who love like he loves and who are committed to living righteous lives out of their desires, who hold out a hope to a hopeless world. The world needs people who are changed at their heart, not people who are keeping it together on the outside. Amen. On the back of your note sheet, on the back of your note sheet, there's, uh, there's one question. So as we go into this, uh, this next time of worship um, and have a moment of reflection, this is one question that I know I'm, I'm going to be asking myself this whole, this whole next week um, that I think is important for all of us to ask. And that question is, what are you missing? What are you missing? We saw three things that people in this passage were missing. We saw what Jesus' brothers were missing. We saw what the crowd was missing. We saw what the Pharisees, what the teachers of the law were missing. But for you, what is it that you're missing? Are you asking God for a sign that he's with you when maybe he wants to draw your attention to what he's already done? Are you looking for God's input in your life but lacking the desire to actually follow when he gives that? Are you focused on the outside and maintaining a righteous appearance when at, at the heart level, you're still living for yourself. What is it that God wants to come and provide that right now you're missing? Would you stand with us as we go into this time? Father, I pray that each and every one of us would take that time to reflect on who you are, what it is that you've done, and ask that question of, what are we missing? Jesus, would you draw our attention back to the things that you've already shown us that highlight who you are, that highlight your love and your care for us? Would you remind us of your signs? Jesus, would you put in our hearts a will and a desire to follow? God, would you invade our hearts and give us a new desire to be people who are changed to live like you, who love like you, who have your character, who are committed to doing what is right, who are committed to what is good, not so that other people notice, but because you've changed 
what it is that our hearts are all about. We ask this in your name so that people would see us and that it would point them to you. Amen.